All right. So everyone's found their seats again. Two quick public service announcements before we continue talking about protein structures. First, uh, a couple of students have approached me with questions about registration for biosystems data analysis. In my previous lecture, I announced that this is done at the UVA. Uh, this year, it is actually done through VUNET. So for both the course and the exam, uh, register through VUNET. Be aware that the course is taught at the UVA by UVA teachers using the UVA exam system, but registration should be done via the VUNET. Second, for the programming midterm this afternoon, uh, I understand not everyone has studied at the VU before, uh, so not everyone knows where to find the actual room that they will be taking the exam in. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's in block eight of the tent. Yeah. So the tent is this uh, big blue cabin uh, roughly over there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's outside on the campus, it's a building of its own. If you look through the window, you see nothing but rows and rows of computers. Uh, that is where you will be taking your programming midterm exam this afternoon. Yes. Are all uh, teacher Uber like courses the optional ones and compulsory courses? Do we always sign up on uh, VUNET for those, or does it vary? Between? To the best of my knowledge, uh, this year full registration for all your courses will <coughs> now go through VUNET. Anton, correct me if I'm wrong. There is possible exceptions for optional courses, which are not part of the compulsory curriculum. Um, but everything you have to follow uh, to get your degree at the end uh, should be registered by a student. I'm sorry, can you speak up? I can't hear you. Can you repeat that? So you can actually also register via the UVA. Is that the message? Okay, very good. Um, any further questions about the program midterm or course registration? <coughs> good. Now let's continue with protein structures. Right. So you've thought a bit about the secondary structures, right? If you just have a stretch of amino acids, they want to make helices and sheets, and they want to start taking on these local <coughs> conformations. If you extend this, um, what you end up with is this thing we call hydrophobic collapse, and eventually a tertiary structure. So uh, outside of alpha helix and beta strands, we also have loops and flexible regions. Uh, loops tend to be more flexible because they are uh, less statically uh, bound in their hydrogen bonds. Uh, and these hydrogen bonds can be satisfied by anything from the next piece of backbone or a non-local piece of backbone, so something from way further or way earlier in the sequence, uh, or it can be a side chain or it can even be the water or the medium that the protein is dissolved in. Now this water is actually very important. Right? Hydrogen bonds in water, um, very common, because all water wants to do is make hydrogen bonds. This is actually why it's the only liquid that we know of that expands when it cools down. Because these hydrogen bonds form a structure. So the oxygen atoms in H2O are negative, the hydrogen atoms in H2O are positive, so this entire molecule wants to make hydrogen bonds. Oil does not want to make hydrogen bonds. I'm not sure how many of you recognize uh, lipid side chains. Uh, this is not a phospholipid yet, but it might very quickly become one if this end or this end esterizes onto a phosphoric backbone. Everyone that's ever stood in a kitchen knows that oil and water do not mix. On a 
energy is emulsifying. So you have an oil fraction, a water fraction, and this is stable because this <coughs> wants to stay together, and the hydrogen bonds from the water want to stay together. Unless you severely agitate or somehow stimulate this mixture, it will not happen. Same thing happens with the hydrogen bond acceptors and donors in proteins. If you have the hydrophilic residues in white and the hydrophobic bits in black, so the things that want to dissolve in water and the things that do not want to dissolve in water, what you see is that the white bits want to stay in touch with either each other or the medium, usually water, and the black bits will want to collapse on themselves so they're exposed to as little water as possible. This is hydrophobic collapse, uh, so you go from an unfolded state to what we call a molten globule, and in 3D space this can be visualized roughly as this. Right? So you have some alpha helices on the outside of this protein, and then you have this hydrophobic core in the center of it. Tertiary structure governs how the secondary structure elements are connected. Right? You can think of it as aligning or twisting your alpha helices, your beta strands, your loops and your helices. Uh, into something that satisfies this hydrogen bonding necessity. You can call this a topology. If you're using sculpt, you can call this an architecture. If you're using CAF, uh, these are both ways of looking at a tertiary uh, structure and classifying this in a way that makes some biological sense. So, why do proteins fold? First of all, hydrophobicity. Um, oil and water don't mix, so oil seeks oil and hydrophils uh, seek hydrophils. Uh, and secondly, the secondary structure elements, uh, the helices and the sheets, um, satisfy the hydrogen bonds in a fairly stable manner, so these try to mix and match in a stable conformation. Uh, I cannot see what comes after this. I think it's quaternary structure. Right, so we've discussed primary, secondary, and tertiary structures. Uh, what we haven't talked about yet is quaternary. This is an example of a quaternary structure. It's a bit much to take in, but what we have here is a bovine F1 ATPase. Uh, it's the ATPase, uh, ATP synthase unit uh, responsible for producing the adenosine triphosphate uh, within bovine cells in this case. So this is where a cow gets its energy. Every chain in this structure is displayed in a different color. So between the molecules of the same color, this complex is formed. Right? Most ATPases have this sort of uh, core or axle, and then this rotating head uh, on its top, consisting of uh, trimers, uh, I believe. Uh, let's see, how many colors can we count here? Uh, we have greenish, then uh, cyanish, and then light blue. So this does look like a trimer to me, yes? Only three. Only three? You can Only count no more colors? Yeah. Anton is colorblind. <laughs> if you ever write a report for him, never use green and red in the same graph. Um, but basically what this does is the, the head of this structure rotates around the axle, and it does so in a way that captures chemical energy um, in ATP. How many different proteins are in this? I see someone holding up five fingers. Let's see, we have three in the head, we have the yellow one and then the red one at the bottom. Yeah, I'd say three to five is about right. Would any of these proteins be useful individually? Hard to say from this, but it's unlikely, knowing a bit about the biology of the system. So, we've been talking about proteins and structures, but in order to get to function, we need to consider this in a bigger context, specifically what the protein interacts with. Right, so the classic picture is that sequence gives rise to structure, and structure gives rise to function. Uh, or, perhaps a bit naively, once we have the structure, 
the function will follow. <coughs> we used to think the same about the genome. Once we have the genome, we understand everything there is to know about life. Turns out we were a bit over ambitious with that claim. But the same line of reasoning holds. So, the enzyme is a specific type of protein. Uh, it's metabolically active. So this is uh, interacting with the small molecules and ligands that you consume and you excrete, uh, and it converts, or it carries out your metabolism uh, through its catabolic and anabolic properties. <laughs> Enzymes are also proteins. So they have a hydrophobic core, they have a hydrophilic surface, they fold, they have secondary structure elements like helices and sheets, What does this tell us about the functional side? So can we tell anything about what bit of the enzyme is important for doing metabolism? <laughs> Given its structure, perhaps. So maybe you could say if there are certain regions in the cell that they would like to help the properties for ligand binding. Okay, so I heard hydrophobic pockets for binding ligands, and oh, what was the second thing you said? Uh, residues with biological function. Okay, how would you recognize biological function from structure? So if we already know where the magic happens, then we can find where the magic happens. <laughs> but you're onto something there, right? Because if we know where the magic happens in one protein, and we find another protein with this weird spot that looks just like the first one, then perhaps they do something similar, right? Scope is in very large part based on this. We see the same weird things in two structures, so they must be similar. It's these structural exceptions that draw our attention, right? Because they deviate from what we had expected if it was just a simple blob of hydrophobic core and hydrophilic surface. A hydrophobic pocket on the surface of a protein is weird. Why would it want a hydrophobic surface? It doesn't make sense because hydrophobic and water doesn't mix. Unless the thing that it wants to bind is also hydrophobic which means that it would then rather be in the pocket than in the surrounding medium. Same thing holds for electrostatic patches or for larger hydrophobic patches on the surface. These might be interfaces or sites of interaction. So as a general sort of rule of thumb, the functional sites themselves are exceptions of the structural rules of thumb. Now here we have three different quaternary structures. We have a uh, red and a blue protein that bind to each other, but they can also bind to a third green protein, and then finally there's this sort of teal banana that also wants to bind to a complex. <coughs> All of these proteins can be said to interact with each other. This is called a protein-protein interaction, and if we map everything we know about which proteins <coughs> touch each other, you end up with this sort of reticulogram. Now, this may seem difficult to parse. You're right, it is. But it also tells us something. Because we know that a protein derives its function from touching other proteins, or molecules, or parts of the medium. So in this enormous, dense, confusing graph, there is in information about what is the function of all these proteins. Now, keep that in the back of your head while we think about predicting some things about structure and function. A couple of questions for you first. 
We've discussed four types or four levels of protein structure. Which information about these proteins is easy to get for us? Relatively cheap, either in terms of money or labor or effort. Sorry, I heard a lot of answers at the same time. Sequences. Sequences are cheap, right? You've been doing this forever. It used to be very hard, but now it's easy. In fact, it's so easy that we can sequence entire genomes for, say, less than a thousand bucks. What information is hard? Tertiary structures, yes. Quaternary structures, also. Secondary structures, used to be. But we know so much about a handful of tertiary structures that we've actually gotten really good at predicting secondary structure from sequence. Is there a pattern in there? Can we use a lot of easy information to expand a bit of expensive information? <laughs> The answer is obviously yes. We can use computational methods to predict tertiary and quaternary structures from primary structure, from sequence. <coughs> and I want to mention a couple of different algorithms that we can use for this. But before I start, I want you to take, say, two minutes to think for yourself what sort of algorithm you could use to go from a lot of sequence and a bit of structure to more structure. After thinking for yourselves, pair up with your neighbor, and then I will pick a couple of you to share with the class what we call it. A stroke of genius yet. With clever ideas about how to predict one of the higher levels of structure from the primary sequence level. Any takers? You sir.
guys, you would reduce the atomic coordinates of an entire structure to a set of vectors. You would use these vectors to describe the structure itself. And then you would try to find a machine learning method that some sequence. Is that correct? Yeah. Good idea. I'm not sure if it's already been done. Very possible. Anyone have a more concrete idea than machine learning? A show of hands, who else thought of feed it to a machine learning algorithm? Very good. I mean, you're starting to think like data scientists. This is excellent. But what a machine learning algorithm doesn't necessarily take into account yet is what we know about the biology of the problem. Has anyone thought of the relationship between sequence and structure? and how you might exploit that very specifically. Uh, um, we did one of things, one of these, and uh, of course, over the modern system, of course, you can kind of define the whole the homework, and you use this homework to get the uh, structure, the homework structure, mm -hmm. and then you can approximate the assumed structure of the structure of the data. Yes, very good. So this is similar to the scenario we discussed earlier, yeah. yes? Where we have a sequence and we have a couple structures in the PDB, 70,000 of them if I recall correctly. Uh, and you would then find the closest sequences in the PDB to your query. And you would then use the associated structures to come up to some prediction. This is actually very, very close to what we call structural alignment. Yes? So making this profile is a key step of cyblast, yes? Um, in fact, the profile is what mathematically represents what we know about the conservation, and thus what we know about the structure. Does everyone follow that? So the suggestion is to start with going from a sequence to a profile, and then using this profile to continue searching for structures. This is exactly what a profile is meant to do. So very good, yes? Okay, but we briefly mentioned structural alignment just now. Talk a bit about that. Um, right, so trying to predict structure from uh, a tertiary structure from the primary sequence uh, is discussed in further detail in the structural bioinformatics course. Um, it's fact entitled uh, predicting protein structure, or protein structure prediction. Uh, you can go about this in a couple of ways. Uh, one of them is structural alignment. So if you already have two structures, without looking at the underlying amino acid residues, you can align the backbones. Right? So suppose we have this blue structure and we have this pink structure, and we're not looking at what actual amino acids they are, but we're only looking at the backbone atoms. Then if we try to paste these over each other, uh, we end up roughly with this alignment. It's a structure alignment, a different problem. But what this also tells you uh, is that there is um, a lot of unexpected alignments between the amino acid residues of these underlying structures. Take a good look at the top right corner. Can everyone read these metrics? So in order this says RMSD, or root mean square distance, uh, Z-score, sequence identity, and aligned versus gap positions. I'll go through this in reverse order. So the aligned versus gap positions is the number of backbone positions in your structure alignment that map between the structures. So we have 202 positions that uh, have a counterpart and 92 gaps. So positions which do not have a matching position in the other one. Sequence identity between these pairs is only 7.4%. This is tiny, this is abysmal. And yet, the z-score of this is 5.5. Does anyone know what a z-score is? Very briefly. 
think the normally distributed data, the z-score, represents the number of standard deviations you are away from the mean. Now, if everyone recalls from high school math that the normal Gauss or bell curve has almost a third of its observations within one standard deviation, 95% of its observations within two standard deviations of the mean, I think 97.9% .9 of its inter, uh, observations within three standard deviations of the mean, 5.5 standard deviations away from the mean is very, very unlikely to occur by chance. You can interpret this somewhat similarly to a mean value. And then finally, the root mean square distance of four angstroms means that every paired atom uh, between these uh, structures <coughs> is on average uh, roughly four angstroms mean. This is not the exact interpretation, but we'll talk more about this in period four if you follow the course. So this tells us that the structures align very well, but the sequences don't align at all. Show of hands, who thinks these are homologs? Can I infer that everyone who has not raised their hands thinks these are not homologs, or are there people that think they can't tell from this information? Okay. Given what we know about evolutionary conservation, function is more conserved than structure, is more conserved than sequence. A structure similarity that is this high strongly suggests that these are in fact homologs, even though this is no longer visible on the sequence level. Now the trick to structural alignment is that it also tells you which of the residues are aligned against one another. Right? So if you look in this structure, say at this position, you might find, uh, I don't know, a methionine against, um, Anton, what's the I? Isoleucine? Isoleucine. I don't recall blossom 62 off the top of my head, but this may or may not be a improbable substitution. So if you start from structures, then you can learn more about what happened uh, in terms of the sequence level between things. This in turn can inform things like deriving <coughs> blossom 62 substitution matrix, or a different one. So this tells you something about sequences and structures. Now, this is a complicated figure, so I'll try to explain it bit by bit. Uh, this was published by Rostatol, uh, what is it, over 20 years ago, uh, but the, the essence of it is still very relevant. Uh, this illustrates what we call the midnight zone. This is very specific for sequence-based homology detection. The blue dots, or the blue curve rather, uh, represents the percentage of pairwise sequence similarity and the number of pairs for a set of truly homologous proteins based on 3D alignment of their structures. The black line through this is a fitted bell curve. Right? So this has a, an average of 35%, uh, a variance of 18 percent, uh, and yeah, you understand this. Then the red line is what you would find if you did not have a sequence similarity <coughs> in a set of homologous proteins, but rather if you were to pick pairs randomly. So if you randomly select sequences and you um, calculate how often uh, a certain percentage of sequence identity occurs between random pairs. The red distribution is what you end up with. So, in your own words, what does this figure show? Anyone? Overlap mean. Sections in which the distribution is constant. Does everyone agree? Yeah, 
So I'm hearing a couple different things here, and I'll just repeat them out loud in case people in the back didn't hear. Uh, there's a lot of overlap. This means that it might be hard to distinguish homologs from random pairs based on sequence alone. And, sorry, your point one more time, please. They are being taken as homologs with less similarity. So, uh, do you mean that you might confuse something for a homolog if it has low similarity? Okay. Right, so you might think something is a homolog even though it's not. Only considering sequence similarity. Okay, everyone follows this? What does this mean for BLAST? This, this super tool that's cited six times a day and that we use to find homologous pairs. Yes, so especially for the low <coughs> end of percentage sequence similarity, if you only consider sequence it is difficult at best and over ambitious at worst to make any claims about whether or not two things are homologous. All right, so coming back to this point that we made on this slide, right? Structure is more conserved than sequence. How can we improve upon this? What does PsyBlast use that Blast does not? Hear it mumbled? Anyone care to say it out loud? Yes, this PSSM represents. That's what it stands for. But biologically, what does the PSSM tell you? Conservation? Right, so the profile tells you something about conservation. The conservation tells you something about structure. So PsyBlast indirectly takes structure into account, even though it's a sequence-based method. Okay, so why do we care about protein alignments once more? Uh, sequence profiles and structures show where the most conserved res residues can be found. And these most conserved residues tell us Typically, what are the functional or the important sites of the protein? Right, so once more, uh, a visualization of the sequence profile uh, showing the conserved residues. What you have here is the active site of, I can't see what protein this is, but we see that across various, um, GABA is on the set too, isn't it? So, across various homologs, these residues are very tightly conserved and we can map this back to this set of residues, which is in the middle of an active site. So, if something is conserved, then this is evolutionarily important for either structure, function, or both. Right. Um, once more, profile profile methods are even better for distant homologs than profile sequence methods, which themselves are much better than sequence sequence methods. Question. No. Not always, but often, yes. Yeah, but the lack of the GFT between fluorescent film and the protein made by beta, beta barrel, yes. and this is a very different function, how to determine the testing. If you do this alignment, it will be very similar. So the beta barrel is a structural <laughs> motif. Yeah. Right? It is a specific orientation of anti parallel or parallel even beta strands. Yeah. What databases like CAF and SCOP do is they consider the number of strands that participate in the barrel, their relative orientations, so parallel or anti-parallel, uh, the length of these strands, 
and also the adjacent secondary structures. Because right? you mentioned porins, which is indeed where we often see beta barrels, but they also have a lot of helices um, surrounding them or even inside the barrel. Whereas if you have a, a set of rotating helices, untwisting these can open the pore and then twisting them back up can close the pore. There is active transport groups which have an ATP binding domain on the inside of the cell and then say a hexose binding domain on the outside. So they bind a glucose molecule and they pull it into the cell by expending energy. All of these things may or may not use beta barrels, but their functions are very different. What is similar, however, is the beta barrel between GFP, RFP, CFP, and all the other fluorescent proteins. Because the difference lies in the active site, the pleural pore, where you have three interacting amino acids that merge together. So the surrounding structure is similar, it's still a fluorescent protein, but the beta barrel itself is different from that of the pore. closeness of the alignment is important for how much information you can infer about one partner from what you know about the other. However, because function is more conserved than structure is more conserved than sequence, only looking for sequence does not tell us everything that there is to know about the structure and function. <coughs> only looking at structure does not tell us everything there is to know about the function. But looking at a whole bunch of structures and then looking only at the ones that are most similar, you might learn something new. Right. So back to this quick, slide quickly then. Um, BLAST is a sequence sequence method. Uh, this is severely outperformed by PsyBLAST, which is a profile sequence method, as you now know. And then I believe all of these others are hidden Markov model based. So these align profiles to other profiles. We've seen that replacing one of the sequences in our query with a profile drastically increases our performance. I think I lost this by once. But now by also taking into account the conservation of the things that we look against, so our query database, if you will, this further enhances your sensitivity and your specificity, as very well demonstrated by HH Fred, which also has a lovely web interface if you want to play around with um, quick overview on what these hidden market models look like. Don't remember this, but do come back next period because you will learn a lot about these. Uh, you have a beginning and an end state, and in between these, you need probabilistic uh, Markov models to uh, predict which residue can be in a certain position, or if a residue can be inserted in a certain position, or if a residue can be deleted in a certain position. And then by comparing the likelihood of a sequence given this generative model, this tells you something about whether the sequence belongs to this model or not. And there are clever ways of finding the best models for a set of sequences. So, again, it's all about the structure. Do we have time for this? Briefly, yes. Okay, I want to show you one more example conservation, sequences, and structures in cancer biology. So not all of you, all of you might be experts in cancer biology, uh, but the, uh, the long and short of it is that cancer is typically driven by the accumulation of deleterious mutations, but cancer itself also causes more mutations to occur. And now a very difficult diagnostic problem to solve here is which mutations caused the cancer and which mutations were caused by the cancer. So they're usually not the same. We call this driver and passenger mutations. I'm sure you understand why. Uh, and basically what this visualizes is how from the moment you are fertilized, uh, you have all your DNA deeply in your nucleus, this DNA is copied every time a cell divides, and when you copy this, mutations start to occur. Now these can be benign, the blue ones for example, 
Uh, these can be neutral, rare ones, uh, or these can be problematic. The cogwheels in this graph will cause issues. <coughs> Not by themselves, but when enough of them accumulate, you start developing cancer. So say you need a dozen of these for tumors to start growing all over your body. And then we find a tumor and we sequence it and we find all the mutations that have occurred, uh, I can't see my pointer, all the mutations that have occurred in your cells throughout your lifetime as they were inherited every time a cell divides. Can you now point to me which 12 of these are the ones that caused your cancer? Keep in mind, this is in the scope of hundreds of thousands of mutations. So without doing something smart, knowing what we know about the biology, this is an impossible task, yes? What we can do is look for which mutations occur more often in tumors versus which mutations occur more often in healthy tissue, where the obvious hypothesis would be that the tumors are enriched for driver mutations, whereas the passenger mutations or the non-driving mutations are sort of uniformly distributed. Okay, so this is one thing we can do. Now what we can also do, this is a very complicated slide, so it might take me a while to get through this, I promise. This is the last one before we're free. The last thing we can do is, again, exploit homology. If we know cancer is caused by a certain process being disrupted, then this process may be disrupted by homologous proteins in different tissue types. A very famous family of signal transducting proteins, the RAS superfamily, EFM identifier 71. And here in the bottom, you see a dendrogram of the evolutionary relationship of five different RAS subfamilies. So all the proteins that you see in this graph are human signal transduction proteins, and they are all related to each other. Now, what we can see in this graph is if you align the sequences, where in this alignment the mutations that we find in tumors occur most often. Again, the reasoning being that tumors will be enriched for driver mutations. So if you align the sequences of, signal, uh, of similar signal transaction proteins, you can count simply where the tumors occur or where the mutations in tumors occur. Now this itself is already a strong signal, yes? But we can go one step further still. And that is based on a simple engineering principle, actually, that the same thing won't break twice. If it's already broken, it doesn't matter again because it's already not doing the thing it should be. This is called mutual exclusivity and especially during the course of bioinformatics for transnational medicine in period five this year you will learn a lot about this um, but the long and short of it is that in this last bit of the table you see in which positions mutations do not co-occur. So this tells me that if something breaks on amino acid 16 Amino acid 17 and amino acid 102 will not break as well. Or rather, that all three of these are critical for carrying out the function of this RAS superfamily. And as luck would have it, this is bang smack in the middle of an active site. So not only are these positions well conserved, the mutations in these positions are also conserved across different types of cancer. Right? We have a whole list. We have skin cell cutaneous melanoma, we have uterine cancer, uh, bladder, colorectal, lungs, and leukemia. Every tissue you can think of that develops cancer has mutually exclusive mutations occurring in conserved sites in one of these signal transduction proteins. So these graphs were made for the Lomaca paper. This is not ours, this is just a very good paper to read. Um, 
but it, it serves to drive home a message about how important aligning sequences, relating this to structure, and relating this to function can be. So, key concepts of what I hope you learned today, uh, four different levels of protein structures, for each of the above, uh, some tools that we use in bioinformatics to deal with this information or to predict more of it, um, which ones are based on structure and sequence, Function is a property from the structure, which is itself encoded in the sequence. Uh, structure is more conserved in the sequence. You should all know now what sequence profiles are and how Psyblast uses these. We haven't talked much about the database effect on PSSMs, but we have briefly discussed that you need enough hits in your query database to actually generate a PSSM for Psyblast that is useful. And then finally, with the Lomaka example at the end here, you can predict the impact of changes in a structure based on what you know on the function and the structure of its homology. And I think that was it. Any questions before I send you off? Excellent. Thanks for your attention, and good luck with your programming interests.